Okay, again, the uh, assignment to start class with is waiting for you on Google Classroom. It's a Ricky Tiki Tabby vocabulary warm up. Um, looks a little something like this. Let me let some people in. Okay. Uh, once you get to the assignment, you'll notice the first page, it's a, it's a two page uh, layout, but the first page is just the vocabulary lists. It's list one and list two. Um, I'll just go over the words, balancing, bread, brood, clinched, fraction, peculiar, splendid, thickets, and it gives you a vocabulary description as well as an example of the terms. Word list B says bungalow, inherited, paralyzed, revived, savagely, scornfully, scuttled, and valiant. Okay, and then on the second page, you will notice that there are two vocabulary exercises um, where you have to fill in the blanks. So fill those blanks in and send that back to me and we'll get started on the story, Ricky Tiki Tabby. You have about 15 minutes to get this one done. <clears throat> okay, we're going to pick back up where we left off. You guys had plenty enough time to do the vocabulary review for Ricky Tiki. Um, we're going to go down and take a look at the opening remarks of the story just to discuss. So um, before the weekend, we talked about a couple of key terms, predicting and foreshadowing. Um, so we're going to learn that in this story, we can make predictions, right, based upon, there we go. We can make predictions based upon what the author does. So in this case, if the author is foreshadowing something, that allows us to go back and make a prediction. Um, so foreshadowing is when an author just hints at something that's going to take place. And then we can therefore predict what's going on with that. Um, for example, if you see clouds, on the horizon, dark clouds on the horizon. What do you think is going to happen out loud? Anybody who wants to answer? Okay. Anybody at home have an answer? It's going to rain. Yeah, you got a storm going on. People in class said storm, rain. A couple people at home said rain. So we know from prior knowledge, from experience, that if I see a storm out there on the horizon, I know that it's eventually going to rain. Same thing in a book, in a story. If the author tells you somewhere in the story, probably in the beginning, that a character saw storms on the horizon or saw dark clouds on the horizon, then you know somewhere in the story a storm is going to happen. It doesn't have to be a rainstorm. It doesn't have to be a literal storm of some kind. It can be a uh, sort of a fictional storm or it can be um, a metaphorical storm. It can be a storm of words. It could be a storm of actions from another character. Um, if it's a fight between two characters, it could be a storm of you know ninjas coming in, or it could be a storm of verbal responses coming in uh, to the character. It could be a storm in the form of some sort of conflict. You know, we talk about the calm before the storm. It doesn't always have to be a real storm. It can be a fictional, metaphorical storm. So we can predict then that something's going to happen based on the foreshadowing, which is a hint at what might happen next. In Ricky Tiki Tabby, we're going to be able to pinpoint a couple of those things. So Ricky Tiki is a story written by a guy named Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling, you might know him from a book called The Jungle Book. 
Okay. So the Jungle Book was just a collection of short stories. Uh, Mowgli stories got put together, create the Jungle Book uh, movies and the Jungle Book of popularity or fame. But this story also appeared in the Jungle Book. So Rudyard Kipling loved writing about India. We're going to get those allusions from the dinner party, like the India setting. Um, talk about the veranda. Um, we'll talk about British rule in India. From the very first paragraph of Riki Tiki Tavi, we get that word Segalway Cantonment. Um, that was a British, um, I guess, a barracks for troops. Um, there's a footnote when we get into the story, but that's just shows us what was going on at the time. So it puts the story in perspective as far as the time frame is concerned. And remember the uh, exposition of stories um, are revealing to us the setting, the characters, and the basic situation. So if you'll look at all of this stuff right here, this is going to be your plot structure. Um, we're going to have to go over plot. We already went over plot structure. You're going to have to go over the plot of Ricky Tiki Tavi um, in a written document. So just try to keep track of all of the plot elements. The exposition we're going to get today, we read the first couple paragraphs um, on Friday, but I'll just remind you, we'll just read through it again. Rising action, that's a building of suspense. You'll see a lot of that. The climax. Okay, you're going to get uh, the climax, which is the most intense part of the story. And then the falling action, that's just going to be putting everything back together again once it falls apart because by the time the climax happens everything has fallen apart right and then you get the resolution which is the end so in a cartoon you might actually get the words the end well stories don't usually do that because that's boring but there will be some sort of closing sometimes they leave it open with a cliffhanger but that's beside the point this one will get some closure okay so let's talk about these vocabulary words revived Um, these vocabulary words are not exactly the same ones that appeared in the activity that you did today. Those were additional vocabulary words. Um, these are the vocabulary words that appear within the story. So we'll talk about all of those in our vocabulary discussions. Revived. Verb. Came back to life or consciousness. Morning. Adjective. Expression of grief, especially after someone dies. Immensely. Adverb. A great deal. Very much. Veranda. Noun. Open porch, usually with a roof. Consolation. Noun. Something that comforts a disappointed person. Cunningly. Adverb. Cleverly. Okay. So those will be the vocabulary words that we'll stop for discussion. So if everybody will share video and make sure that you're on track, we're going to start reading the rest of the story. Um, just so I can stop at different points and maybe ask for some understanding questions, um, you can give me a thumbs up or a hand raise. Um, so just share your videos so that we can see what's going on. And then we'll go ahead and start. And again, I'm going to let it read from the beginning just to keep everybody up to speed. But um, basically, right now, we had a conflict that got solved. We could have left this part out, but it gave us some background knowledge of Ricky Tiki and helped build an emotional relationship with him for the reader so that we're kind of on his side from the beginning because you'll see why we want to be on his side soon. Remember, you also have to access that big question video, um, access the, the prior knowledge video. I'm um, just to give you some added background information. That's where five points. So make sure you're doing that. Ricky Tiki Tavi, Rudyard Kipling. This is the story of the great war that Ricky Tiki Tavi fought single handed through the bathrooms of the big bungalow in Sigali Cantonment. Darcy the tailor bird helped him, and Chuchundra the muskrat who never comes out into the middle of the floor but always creeps round by the wall, gave him advice. But Ricky Tiki did the real fighting. He was a mongoose, 
rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail, but quite like a weasel in his head and his habits. His eyes and the end of his restless nose were pink. He could scratch himself anywhere he pleased, with any leg, front or back, that he chose to use. He could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle brush, and his war cry as he scuttled through the long grass was, Ricky ticky 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 ch. One day, a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother and carried him kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch. Okay, so、um, in our discussion last week, we talked about how this is the exposition part.、Um, we get some background knowledge here. We know Ricky、um, had a conflict, had a flood, got separated from his mom and dad, and some, somehow got washed up where we are now. I said Galway Cantonment. And we're going to say that he is sort of saved here, which is good. You get your first vocabulary word、uh, revived. He's coming back to life or consciousness. He found a little wisp of grass floating there and clung to it till he lost his senses. When he revived, he was lying in the hot sun on the middle of a garden path, very draggled indeed, and a small boy was saying, Here's a dead mongoose. Let's have a funeral. No, said his mother. Let's take him in and dry him. Okay, so that gives us.、Um... Opportunity to predict that Ricky Ticky's probably going to be a pet here.、Um, so, a little bit of foreshadowing involved. There's more foreshadowing to come in just a minute, and that's a bigger part of the story. We'll stop there.、But、you'll notice a snake off to the side and some information about plot.、It、says, What important details about the mongoose are revealed in the exposition?、Um, we're going to have to realize this and write some things down. So, you might want to keep、uh, taking some mental notes. About how the plot thickens, so to speak. Perhaps he isn't really dead. They took him into the house, and a big man picked him up between his finger and thumb and said he was not dead, but half choked. So they wrapped him in cotton wool and warmed him, and he opened his eyes and sneezed. Now, said the big man, he was an Englishman who had just moved into the bungalow. Don't frighten him, and we'll see what he'll do. It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose because he is eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is run and find out, and Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, decided that it was not good to eat. The teachers being testing windows or high ready and imagine math will soon be. Ran all round the table, sat up and put his fur in order, scratched himself, and jumped on the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy, said his father. That's his way of making friends. Ow, she's tickling under my chin, said Teddy. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, snuffed at his ear, and climbed down to the floor where he sat rubbing his nose. Good gracious, said Teddy's mother. And that's a wild creature. I suppose he's so tame because we've been kind to him. All mongooses are like that, said her husband. If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, he'll run in and out of the house all day long. Okay. Let's give him something to eat. They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely, and when it was finished, he went out into the veranda and sat in the sunshine and fluffed up his fur to make it dry to the roots. Then he felt better. There are more things to find out about in this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent all that day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs, put his nose into the ink on a writing table, and burned it on the end of the big man's cigar, for he climbed up in the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lighted, and when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too, 
but he was a restless companion because he had to get up and attend to every noise all through the night and find out what made it. Teddy's mother and father came in, the last thing, to look at their boy, and Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said the father. Teddy's safer with that little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery now. But Teddy's mother wouldn't think of anything so awful. Okay, so at that point, uh, when we look at this part right here, where it says, I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said the father. Teddy's safer than the little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery now, and then we can kind of highlight that. So if a snake came into the nursery now, what do you think that's doing? What's that F word that we were talking about earlier? Foreshadowing, Foreshadowing someone said in the classroom. Um, so, yeah, perhaps a snake will come into the nursery later. And his mom stops the dad. It's like, no, 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 no. Don't say that. I don't want to talk about a snake coming into the nursery. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda riding on Teddy's shoulder, and they gave him banana and some boiled egg, and he sat on all their laps one after the other, because every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose someday and have rooms to run about in, and Ricky Ticky's mother, she used to live in the general's house at Seagowley, had carefully told Ricky what to do if ever he came across Englishmen. Then Ricky Ticky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only half cultivated, with bushes as big as summer houses of Marshall Neal roses, lime and orange trees, clumps of bamboos, and thickets of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground, he said, and his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it, and he scuttled up and down the garden, snuffing here and there. Till he heard very sorrowful voices in a thorn bush. Okay, so we get this idea of a half cultivated garden. And we talk about all these different plants. I have an activity for you later that discusses the garden. I also have um, another story for you that you're going to read after we finish this story. It's on common lit, um, and there will be five questions for you to do, but it's about a cobra in the garden. Um, it kind of gives us a positive view of a cobra. We've read two stories now that give us negative views of the cobra, the dinner party, and Ricky Tiki Tavi. So um, we're going to get uh, at least one positive aspect of it, um, just to keep things um, in perspective. Because there are always two sides to every story. Um, there's Ricky's perspective, and then there's going to be the cobra's perspective. And we're about to meet him, so let's think about that. So Ricky's hearing the cries of a couple uh, birds that live in the garden. Um, you're going to hear from Darcy and his wife. His wife is never mentioned uh, by name, but um, she's a strong character throughout the story. That refers back to the dinner party as well. The women characters in this, um, at least the animal ones, tend to be pretty strong. And you'll see that in just a second. It was Darcy, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stitching them up the edges with fibers, and had filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What is the matter? asked Ricky Ticky. We are very miserable, said Darcy. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday, and Nag ate him. Hmm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad, but I am a stranger here. Who is Nag? Darcy and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering. So Ricky asks a very important question. Who is Nag? Doesn't know anything about Nag. He just got there, hasn't had any um, association with, with any other animals except these guys. So, you know, he's just kind of asking, oh, who's Nag? Um, and, and they don't say 
that um, it was a cobra, but we get the in indication very shortly. And it comes about in kind of a weird way. And you'll see what I mean by that in just a second. They're gonna explain what's going on here. Um, you can almost hear some music playing in the background and see like a shark fin coming up out of the water. If you listen closely, just listen to the description of this. For from the thick grass at the foot of the bush, there came a low hiss, a horrid cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two clear feet. Then inch by inch out of the grass rose up the head and spread hood of Nag, the big black cobra, and he was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one-third of himself clear of the ground, he stayed balancing to and fro exactly as a dandelion tuft balances in the wind, and he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake's eyes that never changed their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking of. Who is Nag? he said. I am Nag. What an introduction that was. So you get this entire paragraph of this looming villain in the background coming into the scene and it almost feels like like a jaws movie or something because you see him coming up out of the grass ever so slightly and you almost hear that music so that's a really good introduction what is it when he said when they can see like coming over in my mind the, the, the jaws like yeah you could hear that da 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 and he's really conceited, this Nag character is. Listen to what he says about himself. He's like, who's Nag? I'm Nag. He, he's given a really good introduction to himself. The great god Brahm put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brahm as he slept. Look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Ricky Ticky saw the spectacle mark on the back of it that looks exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for the minute, but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time, and though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones, and he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Okay, so Ricky's had the taste of snake, knows what it's like, and it says he was afraid, but for not very long, because Nag was really intimidating, so Ricky has to kind of sit back and say, hmm, okay. I got your number. He's looking at this snake like, I don't know that you think you're bad, but you don't know about me. But that's the thing. Nag does know about him. Listen to what it says about Nag in just a minute. Nag knew that too. And at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Right. So Nag's heard about these mongoose creatures as well. And it doesn't say anything about him not staying frightened for too long, does it? It just says at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. So he was talking himself up, acting all big and bad, but he was really afraid. And those are the most dangerous kinds of villains because they're unpredictable, the scared ones. Um, so he might do anything. And Ricky knows that. So Ricky has to be very cautious. But now we get the conflict. Almost. There's one more step to it. Let's see what that step is. Because Nag's talking a bunch of junk right now. Nag's talking a lot of game, right? He's doing that as a distraction. Wonder what he's distracting Ricky Ticky from. Anybody have any ideas? An attack from who? Another snake, maybe, or what'd you say? Either another snake or like he's gonna try to destroy Okay, maybe another snake. Let's see. Well, said Ricky Ticky, and his tail began to fluff up again. Marks or no marks, do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings out of a nest? Nag was thinking to himself and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family, but he wanted to get Ricky Ticky off his guard. So he dropped his head a little and put it on one side. Let us talk, he said. You eat eggs. Why should not I eat birds? Behind you, look behind you, 
sang Darcy. Ricky Ticky knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could go, and just under him whizzed by the head of Nagina, Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him, and he heard her savage hiss as the stroke missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that then was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit indeed, but did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagina torn and angry. Wicked, wicked Darcy, said Nag, lashing up high as he could reach toward the nest in the thorn bush. But Darcy had built it out of reach of snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Okay, so we get a new character introduced here, maybe even more sinister than Nag. The story even refers to her as his wicked wife, right? So we get his wicked wife coming into play here. She's me. Also seems to be the boss, because she's the one who probably devised this plan, this plan sneaking up behind him, sent her husband out to get him off guard, and then she was going to creep up from behind and attack. So. We have to ask the question, <clears throat> who struck first here? Who drew first blood? Nag and Nag's wife, yeah. So they came into the scene and they attacked right off the bat. So that's our conflict. And Ricky has nothing else to do but retaliate for fear of his own life. I mean, he's got to do something with these snakes. So he knows that they're just going to try to get him at, at no, no matter what cost. So now we have a conflict. So let's think about that as we read on for just a minute. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry. And he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo and looked all around him and chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagaina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its stroke, it never says anything or gives any sign of what it means to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them, for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find they say that when the mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. That is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongooses jump, and as no eye can follow the motion of a snake's head when it strikes, that makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Ticky knew he was a young mongoose, and it made him all the more pleased to think that he had managed to escape a blow from behind. It gave him confidence in himself, and when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. Okay, so here we understand um, the conflict and maybe can predict the outcome of the conflict based on the beginning of the story, the exposition. This is the story of how Ricky Ticky Tavi managed to clean the garden up from these ruthless snakes. Wasn't that how the story kind of started out? So we can kind of make predictions here. We don't want to give too much away, but now we know there's going to be a fight, not only between Ricky and Nag, but Ricky and who? His wife, Nagina. They have to, he has to fight two snakes now. So let's, uh, let's go on and see what unfolds here. We'll go a little further and then we'll stop. Uh, we're not going to get done with the entire thing today just because um, I want to give you a break. Last class didn't finish, so keep everybody roughly on the same track. But just as Teddy was stooping, something flinched a little in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful, I am death. It was Karite, the dusty brown snakeling that lies for choice on the dusty earth, and his bite is as dangerous as the cobra's but he is so small that nobody thinks of him, and so he does the more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, and he danced up to Karite with the peculiar rocking, swaying motion that he had inherited from his family. 
It looks very funny, but it is so perfectly balanced, a gait that you can fly off from at any angle you please. And in dealing with snakes, this is an advantage. If Ricky Ticky had only known he was doing a much more dangerous thing than fighting Nag, for Karite is so small and can turn so quickly that unless Ricky bit him close to the back of the head, he would get the return stroke in his eye or lip. But Ricky did not know. His eyes were all red, and he rocked back and forth, looking for a good place to hold. Karite struck out. Ricky jumped sideways and tried to run in, but the wicked little dusty gray head lashed within a fraction of his shoulder, and he had to jump over the body, and the head followed his heels close. Teddy shouted to the house, Oh, look here! Our mongoose is killing a snake! And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick, but by the time he came up, Karite had lunged out once too far, and Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, dropped his head far between his forelegs, bitten as high up the back as he could get hold, and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Karite, and Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him up from the tail after the custom of his family at dinner when he remembered that a full meal makes a slow mongoose, and if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready, he must keep himself thin. He went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes, while Teddy's father beat the dead karite. What is the use of that? thought Ricky Ticky. Okay, so we'll stop there, but we understand now that Ricky had just had some practice, so... He gets attacked by another snake. This garden is full of snakes that want to hurt Ricky. Um, and he beats this one. Um, and this is a sneaky little dust snake, right? So um, Ricky just kind of gets his feel for snakes here. He's coming into his own. He's practicing on this one. So we know he can get the job done, right? Think about that for our next meeting. All right. Any questions? Your job is to finish up the... Vocabulary exercise if you didn't do so for next class. All right. If there are no questions, I'll go ahead and let you go.